found your way there, I want to read to you verses 12 through 18. And I want to try to preach a message that I've titled, Don't Let Your Light Get Dim. Now, last week I received a compliment. I'm not being boastful or bragging, but this compliment uh, really meant a lot to me. And someone told me, said, thank you for being a bright light. And boy, it, it touched my heart and I thought, I'm thankful that others could see that. And again, I'm not being boastful and bragging this morning, but that's what it's all about. It's not about us. It's about uh, the Lord shining through us and the Lord using us. And I pray that all of us this morning can say that we are a, a light for the Lord and that others see that. Now, the world that we live in today, I don't want to get sidetracked before I start reading our scripture this morning, but the world wants us to see darkness. They want us to see all the evil that's in the world today. But us as Christians, we need to shine bright through that darkness and be the light that God has called us to be. But Matthew chapter 5, I'll begin reading verse number 12. It says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we do once again, Lord, just thank you and praise you for this great and wonderful day that you've given us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord, to, to lift our praises to you, Lord, to, to sing songs that uh, honor and glorify you, Lord, to bring our prayer requests to you, Lord, and also, Lord, to, to bring our offerings to you. Father, we are a blessed people, and we take so much for granted, and we're all thankful today, Lord, that we can just get out of bed and, and get to church and be able to worship you. Father, I pray today for those that are not as fortunate, those that are shut in, those that are at the nursing homes, those that are sick, the ones that wanted to be here, Lord, but for whatever reason they couldn't. I pray, Lord, that you would also send a blessing their way as well. I pray, Father, as we go through this service, that, Lord, that, as I always say, that you take the focus off me and you put it on you, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and your precious Word. I pray today that our Christian hearts would be challenged as we open up your Word and we expound upon your Word, that we would be brighter lights for you in this dark world. I pray that our witness and testimony would grow stronger and we'd leave here, Lord, today having a, a greater desire wanting to serve you. And I pray, too, Father, for some that may be here today that have never accepted Christ as their Savior, that they've never been born again. I pray today would be a, a great day. As Brother Mike said, Lord, when he read the word today, Lord, would be a great day for them to get saved. So, Father, again, we just can't thank you and praise you enough. We'll give you all the honor and all the glory, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, by the way of introduction, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse number 1, it says that he saw the multitudes, and he went up into a mountain, and he was set. His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And he goes through these verses, verse number 3 through number 11, are the Beatitudes, or what many would call the blessings. And I often look at these, and I find it strange in my little people mind that because of all these blessings, there comes suffering. If you look at all of them, for example, I'll, I'm not going to read each and every one of them to you, but just the very first one that he gives, number three, verse number three says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, not too many of us today are lining up at the doorstep that we want to be poor. But he says, Those that are poor in spirit, says, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes down in verse four, he says, Blessed are they that mourn. Not many of us are standing in line this morning and looking for a time where we could mourn. Many of us today are mourning. We're still mourning. Our family's still mourning loss that we've had. There's families 
with inside of our church that are still mourning today, but none of us want to go through those situations. But Jesus tells his disciples that blessed are they that mourn. And he says, they shall be comforted. I'm thankful today that Jesus provides that comfort. He goes on down in verse number 10, and he says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Again, I don't see anybody standing in line saying, Here, I am, persecute me. I want some persecution. If you are, I'll, I'll pray for you. I don't know what's, what's going on there. But none of us are standing in line for persecution sake. And he says, For theirs, again, is the kingdom of heaven. And then the last one that I said, verse number 11, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And I believe we're in those times right now. We're especially in those times where the world is looking at the church. They're looking at Christians and they're saying, uh, they're persecuting, they're reviling us, and they're saying things that, that certainly aren't true. And it says that they'll speak all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake. But he goes on and he gives us that comfort in verse 12 where he says rejoice. I'm thankful that we need to pause whenever the Lord says rejoice. We need to look closely at that. There's many things in our life that we can rejoice about. Uh, as, as a father, many times I'm proud of my kids and I rejoice over some of the accomplishments that they do. Now also many times I kind of shake my head in doubt and disbelief at the things they do too and, and wonder where in the world do they get that? And I think, well, they take after their mother. But anyway, we all want to rejoice. But anytime the Lord says rejoice, I think we need to pause and look because it's certainly a reason to rejoice. Many times something that we would choose to go through but we will rejoice. He said, be exceeding glad. Not just glad, but exceeding glad. It reminds me that when Jesus is involved, it's not just going to be average. It's not just going to be ordinary. It's not going to be just barely enough. It's going to be exceeding. And he says, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And we know that, that now those prophets that he spoke about are in heaven today. And he says that they've been rewarded and that they went on and they received persecution before us. But then he goes on after he gives these blessings to these disciples and he gives them a challenge. And literally, I think his challenge is what I said today is that we need to let our light shine. He told them that they're going to go through all these things of suffering, but through all those, they'll be blessed. But he also told them, he said, where I picked up and uh, started reading in verse number 12, but... He said that we could rejoice over that and be glad. In verse number 13, he said that we are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. And I often thought about this, and I, I don't know many other ways to put it besides uh, the analogies that I give you of a, of a good old country boy and, uh, and how salt relates to us. But I'll, I'll get to that here in just a few minutes. But you would think that this message would be hard to preach. Blessed are those that are poor. Blessed are those that are mourned. But it's not. And for Jesus, it's not hard at all because he provides the light. He provides what we need, and that's what he, he's telling them here. So today, for me, when we look at some of these verses in the Scriptures, uh, they're all inspired by the Word of God. And as a pastor, I can't pick and choose the ones that I think are relevant. I have to be obedient to what the Lord uh, calls, and he's given us his entire Word. And I believe that it's inerrant, it's infallible, it's perfect from beginning to end. And this morning he's pointed us to this. And I thought, well, how can I stand before the people and say that we must go through suffering in order to be blessed? I can do that because that's what the Lord has instructed. And that's what the Lord instructed his disciples. And it's easy for us because he is that light. And he's the one that gives us that light. But I said when I started the message that don't let your light get dim. And we have a choice today. We have a choice to, to be that bright light for the world, or we have a choice just to blend in with the rest of the world. We're, the, the Bible tells us we're called out to be a peculiar people, a zealous people, unto good works for Him. When I was in our former church, and my wife and I taught class, and we taught third through fifth graders, I would tell the kids not to be a chameleon. It's a little animal, a little lizard, that this when he's in trouble, he just blends in with his surroundings so that he doesn't get harmed. And that's what God's given him, that ability. But God doesn't give us that ability. He doesn't want us to, when things get a little bit tough, 
when things that look like we don't want to stand for him, that we just kind of, okay, I'm going to change my color today. I'm going to blend in with this group or I'm going to blend in with this crowd. He's told us he wants us to, to stand out and be a bright light for him. But we're living in times where uh, evil is called good and good is called evil. Uh, Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 5 and verse number 20, he says this, Woe unto them. Woe unto them. And when I read these words, it, it catches your eye and catches your mind. But we should still, even though they're from uh, the prophet Isaiah thousands of years ago, it's still a relevant to us today. And when we hear these words, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And then it, it goes on and it tells us here, I, I promise you I'll get to the, to the message. It says, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. And I believe that's where we're at. We're in a, in a day and time where people are wanting to put darkness in place of light. And they're wanting to put light in place of darkness. And it says they put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, I already mentioned to you this morning, it just warms my heart each and every Sunday to hear these kids singing. And I, I like to see the, the numbers growing as well. Uh, boy, it, it just warms my heart to see some of them singing, some of them bouncing and dancing, and some of them running around. And, uh, you know, I, I just warms my heart. They're excited to be here, and I'm thankful for it. The kids sing a, a little song that comes to my mind, uh, This Little Light of Mine. Now, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm that hardcore that I'm picking on that song this morning, but I'm going to pick on it just for a little bit. There's a, a verse in that song that says, uh, it goes on, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Now, don't get nervous, I'm not going to sing to you. But it, uh, <laughs> it goes on and says, don't let Satan blow it out. And I don't think that that verse is 100% scripturally accurate. Now, I am encourage our kids to keep singing that song. Keep singing. It's, it's completely innocent what they say. But Satan can't blow our lights out. He can't do it. He doesn't have the ability to blow it out. If God has given you the light, he can't blow it out. He can't take it away from you. For, for weeks, I've preached to you about grace, uh, that we're saved by grace through faith. And I said that I'm a, a grace preacher. I believe in the doctrine of grace. I also believe in the doctrine of eternal security, that once we're saved, that we're sealed into the day of redemption, that no man can take us away our salvation, no man, no power, no principality. So therefore, I believe that Satan can't blow out our lights. But let our, let our kids keep singing that song, that's fine. But we as Christians, our light can, can get dimmed and they can get turned down. So today, that's where I want to get into a couple points where I, I, I pray that it will help you, that it will encourage you, uh, that we can help keep our light from being dim, that we can continue to be bright for him. The first one I want to look at is that in verse number 13, and that is worldly distractions. And everybody's nervous. All oh, the preacher's preaching about worldly distractions. Again, he's going he's gonna to talk about all of these things that we have that we shouldn't have, and I, I'm not. Don't get nervous. I want to tell you here what Jesus said. He said in verse number 13, he says that we are the salt of the earth. Remember I told you that I was going to give you a good theological analogy about that. This is how I, everything relates back to me to food. When you're cooking a good pot of beans, what do you add to it? Salt. salt. Some kind of meat that's been preserved or cured with salt. It gives it its flavor. Nobody wants to have bland food. We were at the beach a few weeks back and I had went to the store, I told you I had bought that $6 notebook and about to die. And we also bought some Pringle potato chips that were severely overpriced. Um, Rachel was eating a pack of them and she handed them back to me. She said, these don't have enough salt on them. Give me another pack. I thought, wow, Rachel, I just paid $4 for these potato chips. Can't you tough it out. But listen, nobody wants to, to have anything that's just kind of bland, just kind of there. When we want to cook something, we want it to taste it. We want to have to see the flavor in it. We want to see the goodness in it. And that's what God wants for us. He wants to see the flavor in us. He wants to see the goodness in us. And he says that we are the salt of the earth. We are his flavor here on this earth. We're the ones that are called to go throughout the earth to, to make an impression for him, that our lights might shine for him. It's our responsibility to make sure that our lights are shining bright for him. We're not called, as I said, to, to blend in uh, to this world. He goes on, he says this, that if we've lost that flavor, if we've lost our flavor, basically he says that we're no good. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? He said, it is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. 
Just like Rachel threw that can of Pringles to the side and was looking for the salt and vinegar. She wanted the, the salty ones. That's what the Lord says for us in the world. I, I can't use you if you don't have the flavor that I've given you. If your light's not shining bright for us, I, we're, we're going to move on to the, to the next person that, that is. And that is a shame. And we should be wanting to be the flavor of the earth, the salt of the earth. Now, uh, there's many things here that we see when those things become important to us over what God would have for us, our flavor begins to, to go away. Now, I could give you a list of things, and I, I told you I wouldn't, and I'll be, I'll be an honest preacher this morning. I'm not going to give you a list of distractions that can keep you out of church, that can keep you out of your Bible, that can keep you from praying, that can keep you from spending time with your family, that can keep you from visiting those that are sick and shut in, and those uh, that need the, the message of God. You can, you can make those own lists for yourself because your list is different from my list. Now, trust me, uh, my list is big. It, it grows every day. I need to, to have more flavor. I need to have a brighter light for the Lord because we let these things creep in, and many times they're innocent things. They're innocent things that come into our life, and, and this morning we may have chosen to, to do this activity over church. And now I just told you that we were at the beach two weeks ago. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy doing things. I'm not saying that we're not to enjoy ourselves. We're not to, to have leisurely activities. But what I'm saying is that many times that when we choose those things over the, the Word of God, when we choose those things over church, our flavor begins to lessen and lessen. Believe it or not, the world is looking at us. They're looking at us this morning as we got up, we got dressed, we put on our Sunday clothes, and we got in our car, and we drove off to church. And you might have a neighbor that doesn't attend church, doesn't believe in God, and they watch you every Sunday as you leave. Whether or not, well, there's Brother Josh, he's, uh, he's going to church, he's got his uh, suit on, I see he's carrying his Bible in his hand. But there may be a morning where I decide, well, I'm not going to go to church this morning, I'm going to... I'm going to head out to the, to the lake and do some fishing. Boy, it's a, it's a beautiful morning today. It's overcast. It'd be, the sun won't pour down on me. Well, the next thing you know, here in a couple of weeks, I decided to do the same thing. And before you know it, I'm in a habit of that. And my neighbor that used to see me get in my suit and jacket and, and go to church carrying my Bible has seen me grab my fishing pole and, and head off to the lake. You see what I'm saying? Just It creeps in. It's innocent things like that. I could go on and on and on. But when these things become more important to us than God, then that's where we have a problem. That's where our flavor begins to lessen. Now you say, well, well, Pastor, can you? Uh, does that mean that I won't have a home in heaven? No, it does not. If you're truly saved, if you've truly accepted Christ as your Savior, if something would happen to you today, you would die, you would go to heaven. However, I would believe and question that, that uh, if we are truly saved, born again, that uh, the Holy Spirit of God will convict our hearts convict our lives that we won't want to take that fishing pole on Sunday mornings and go to the lake. That we want to grab that Bible. We want to head off to church. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think that we need to give God our best, but just because I wear a, a suit and tie and a jacket in church don't mean you have to. If you uh, have second thoughts that you were going to head out to the lake and, and you're wearing blue jeans or shorts and you decide you want to come on to church, grab your Bible and come on to church. I'll preach to you whether uh, you're wearing a suit and tie or whether you're wearing blue jeans. I don't think that, the, that that is necessarily important. But when, before I get way too sidetracked this morning, what I'm saying is these worldly distractions, these small things that can ease into our lives can happen and they seem very innocent. But be aware because there's one who likes to call light darkness. He is what the Bible refers to as the prince of this world. That's Satan. That's the enemy. And believe it or not, he'll dangle these things in front of you, these worldly distractions, these innocent things. He'll dangle them in front of you. You say, oh, well, Brother Josh won't miss you down there at the church this morning. They got several other good men down there. They don't, they don't need you down there at the church this morning. You can go ahead and head out and do whatever you want to do. I preached a few weeks ago about screen time. Some of you don't have uh, social media, and I applaud you for that. Uh, I've, I've gotten sucked up in the mess of, of social media. I use it to try to promote the message of the church and try to do things that, are, that glorify and honor the church as well. But I find myself scrolling through and looking at people's posts and looking at things and you just get consumed and caught up in it. And I said that I had an update come across my phone and it showed me how much time I had spent on my phone and I was just floored. I was amazed by how much time I had spent staring at my screen, screen time. And that still convicted my heart to this 
to this very day. I said, you know, if, boy, if we would give God the same amount of time that we give that screen, I believe we could do a, a world of good. And my kids, uh, if you was here for Sunday school this morning, I said, Ella, where's Ella at? There she is. And she's smirking and smiling already. Tell them what, what message I sent you. I told her, I said, yeah, I did have my phone too, but I knew she was staring at hers. I said, if I see you on that phone one more time, it's mine. It's gone. I haven't seen it anymore. But listen, the, the, the younger generation, I'm not trying to be an old fuddy-duddy, but listen, we need to, to encourage these kids to get into the Word of God as well. We need to encourage them that, yeah, you can you can stare at that phone all day long. You can get on Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and, and Snapchat and all these other things that they have, and, and you can do good things. But boy, if we would take that same amount of time and give it to the Lord, I believe that we could do wonderful things. Our light would be shining so much brighter. And I'm not just preaching to you all this morning, I'm preaching to myself as well. And that goes for any other thing where we could take that same time that we give to other activities and give it to God. I'm working on a message that the Lord has given me and it's going to be something to affect the title, Give God 40 Days. We've uh, talked about it in Sunday school. The, the number 40 is very significant throughout the Bible. And there's many things that we can learn from that number 40. And I'm working on that, that if we would give God, most people say, I'll give, give it 30 days, a 30-day challenge. Anybody ever heard of a 30-day challenge? There's, if you listen to Christian radio, there's a lot of times a 30-day challenge that if you listen to Christian radio for 30 days, you won't want to go back and listen to any other radio. I encourage that. But I'm going to take it one step further and look at the Word of God. And uh, there's many significant things about 40. And I believe that if we could truly devote 40 days uh, to God, boy, we could turn this world upside down. So the first thing I've told you is this, that those worldly distractions can make our lights dim. We need to, to keep them to a minimum so that we can shine bright. And then the, the second thing is in verse number 14. He goes on this and he tells those disciples, he says in verse 14, he said, You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. Now, one of our favorite places, uh, we had this discussion, I think it was Wednesday night. Uh, I like to travel, I like to go and do things, but I like where I live. I'm thankful that I'm born and raised in Page County, and uh, it's no better place for me to be than here. I enjoy seeing the ocean, uh, but I'm thankful to be back here in the mountains. This is where I feel comfortable. I don't have sea legs. I've got mountain rock climbing legs. I'm not built for, to be out on the water. And uh, some of you may disagree with that, but um, uh, we live in one of the, the greatest places, I think, in the world. And if you don't believe it, go up on the Skyline Drive and go to one of the overlooks just before dark. Look down throughout the valleys and see all these lights that are there. And let it remind you of this verse in, in verse 14 of Matthew 5, that we are the light of the world. Now those cities, where all the actions at, it's where all the activities at. You see all the street lights, you see the, all the businesses and all the lights. Uh, of these of these cities and the Lord's telling his disciples the same thing here he says that we or you he said are the light of the world and even though I'll pause to tell you that this message was given from Jesus to his disciples it's still as relevant to you and I as it was to his disciples the day that, that he preached it or the day that he gave it to them but he said that we are the light of the world now many times I think that one of the reasons why our light is very dim is because we're just barely keeping our head above water. Now again this morning, I'm not preaching to any particular person. If you feel convicted, trust me, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. But I'm preaching to myself this morning when I preach this point. Keeping your head above water. Many times we want to go, 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 and we are rush, rush, rush. Now I'll give you another good uh, spiritual, scriptural analogy like I always do. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, what TV show is he going to use this time? <laughs> I'm going back to my very old favorite, uh, Andy Griffin. Now, I listened to a preacher just a few weeks ago, and he kind of he, he, uh, was stepping on my toes because he was talking about Andy Griffin. He was talking about marriage and how important marriage is. And he said, you know, when you look at the show Andy Griffith, nobody was married. He said the only person that was married in town was Otis, and he was a drunk. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that. I was like, you know, he's right. Nobody else was married, but... But I still think it's a good show, and I'm not gonna, it's not going to stop me from this morning from using this uh, example. But you might have watched the episode when the traveling preacher come to town. And I, I love to have traveling preachers come in and come through the church. Number one, it gives me uh, a break. Number two, it, it lets me hear the word as well. I need to be preached to just the, just the same way that you need to be preached to. That's why this morning, when I said this point, is touching my heart just as much. I pray 
that is touching your heart. But that traveling preacher came through Mayberry and he preached about slowing the pace down. That we need to get to, to a slower pace of life. And all the people related to it, Andy and Barney and Aunt B and all of the people in the community related to it. And it got them to thinking about the old times, how things were much better. And many of us could think, oh, praise the Lord, I, I think so too. I can even look back in my life and say that some of the old times were much better times. But they got to thinking about all these old times and it, it sparked them to start up the town band again. Y'all remember the episode? And they went to look for their outfits for costumes. They had holes in them. They were all wore out, so they were busy. They said, well, we need to, we need to have a concert. And uh, they went ahead and, and set that concert for like two days later. So they were, had a group going together trying to get those costumes sewed and mended and fixed up. They had a group of men trying to fix the stage up. And they were just running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And they were not paying a bit of attention to the message that the preacher had given them about slowing down their pace of life. But I think about that many times that's us. We talk about it all the time. I talk about it all the time. I say, I need, to, I need to slow down. I need to give more time to the Lord. I need to give more time to my family. I need to give more time to the church. But yet it seems like we just keep going and going and we're barely keeping our head above water. When I got back to work uh, last week from being on, on the vacation, uh, Friday I was talking on the phone to somebody. They said, well, how are you doing? I said, well, I, I finally feel like I've got a little breathing room. I finally feel like I got my head above water just a little bit. You have to, you work hard for a, uh, to go on vacation, you're on vacation, and you work even harder to catch up when you get back. But you see, the, the devil, he wants us to, to stay busy. He wants us to be distracted. He wants us to be going about. He wants us to be barely keeping our head above water because the least little thing is going to pull us under. The least little thing is going to be the, the breaking point that we need. But we need to look at what Jesus said to this. He says that we need to be a city that's set on the hill. We don't need to be just barely holding our head above water. We don't need to be just barely hanging on. We need to be setting the example. We need to be setting high on the hill like he told him here because Jesus uh, has overcome this world. In, uh, in the Gospel uh, of John, in the 16th chapter, uh, he said this. He told his disciples also, he said, These things I've spoken unto you. Basically, he's telling them, I've told you this before, but I've got to tell you again. These things I've spoken unto you that you might have peace. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. Remember who I said earlier was the prince of the world? The devil. And he wants us to have tribulation because Jesus has told us that if we get tied up in the world, we're going to have tribulation. He said, in the world you should have tribulation. But he tells him again, he says, be of good cheer. He says, I have overcome the world. And I'm thankful today that Jesus has overcome the world. He's overcame this world. If you are a child of God, if you put your faith and trust in him, then he's called you to be the light of this world that he's overcome. He's called you to be a city that's set on a hill that's up high that everybody can see, can see your light shine. Now, you don't have to be a, a great big number to be effective. I truly believe with all my heart that if you have 10 Christians who are on fire for the Lord, that their light will be much brighter than 100 Christians that are lukewarm. If you remember in the book of Revelation, what uh, the Lord said he was going to do with those that are lukewarm. He said he was going to spew them out of his mouth. He's going to vomit them out of his mouth. I use that analogy many times that literally when God looks at us and sees us lukewarm, it makes him sick because he said he's going to spew us out of his mouth. I believe that 10 people who are on fire for the Lord will have a much brighter light than 100. Now, when we were at our previous church, Rachel and I were co-directors of our vacation Bible school. And uh, I think Vacation Bible School is a wonderful outreach for a church in order to, to draw families into the church to minister to the young people. And I pray in, in, that uh, next year that we can have a good uh, Vacation Bible School here at our church. But at that old church uh, we were at, uh, we would get all excited about Vacation Bible School, and we did. We had some wonderful Vacation Bible Schools. But one year, uh, we put so much emphasis on numbers and, and challenges for kids to invite friends and invite family. And uh, one night we had 205 kids at Vacation Bible School. And I can tell you that 205 kids is hard to handle. <laughs> hard to handle. When I went home and I told Rachel, I said, do you think that we're being effective with these kids? And we can go out and we can tell the community that we had 205 kids at Vacation Bible School. Now, I think we were effective. We had a wonderful group of people that worked and labored 
and uh, I believe we are effective. But many times we get so caught up in these numbers, and I believe that we can be, if we have too much, we can be ineffective. Same way with these activities where we're barely keeping our head above water. If we keep taking on this task or this challenge or doing this thing, the next thing you know, we're being less and less effective. And that light, excuse me, that Jesus has called for us to be bright, has called for it to be a city set on the hill, is starting to be hidden a little bit. Now, remember I told you I don't believe it can be blowed out. It's going to be dim and dim and dim. And the more we the things we get ourselves uh, involved in many times, we, we pull ourselves down, our light will be dim. So I would encourage you to keep your head above water. Keep looking to the Lord. Keep looking to the one who's overcome the world. Now, many times it's easy for me to sit here and preach this because there's many things, many of you may be going through it in your life right now that seems it's going to overtake us, that we are drowning literally. We're barely hanging on because of the troubles and the, the problems that we're going. But I can tell you, use these verses in John 16 that Jesus has overcome the world. And then the last thing is this, and I'll close this morning, is... That prince of the earth, that enemy that I've talked about, Satan, boy, he can, he can make your light as dim as it can get. And he wants to do that. You know, many times we, we look at people's lives, and, and I've told you the reason why I started out that he told these disciples that they must suffer in order to be blessed. Now, I'm paraphrasing uh, all those 11 verses that he used there, but we must suffer in order for us to be blessed. And many times we look at people and say, why do, do such good people have to go so, through so many trials? There's people right here in our church that are going through trials, husbands and wives both that are dealing with health problems and, and families that have issues, and we wonder these things. And I can only go back to, to these verses that Jesus told his disciples that we must have suffered in order for us to be blessed. I believe that it would encourage us to be a brighter light. But you see, Satan, he wants to dim your light as much as possible. And Satan, or I would say a synonym or a slash would be sin. Sin can destroy our testimony just like that. And you look at people who are outside of, of the church who don't attend church, and we many times we look at that and say, well, look at that person there. I know what they do. I know that they, they go to the liquor store three or four times a, a week. They, they're hooked on drugs, and yet they don't go through all these troubles that I do. I would caution yourself to, to this and they look, the, the world already has those. Satan has a hold of, of those people. We are more of a threat to him. That's why he's uh, causing these trouble. That's why he wants to, to wreak havoc on us. Their light is, is not shining. Many of them have never accepted the light. They've never accepted Christ as their Savior. They don't have the light. That's why sometimes I believe that Satan's using all of his tools to get to us, to get to the Christians, to get to the church. I told you earlier that I said that I'm a, a grace preacher. Remember that always. We talked about it at the Sunday school this morning. We're saved by grace. We need to be that bright light. We need to make sure that Satan's not dangling those carrots in front of us to dim our light so that we can be a witness to those people that are out in the community. Those that many times we don't understand, why are they not going through the trials and the challenges and the struggles that we are? God is using our troubles. He's using our trials uh, to be a witness and to be a blessing to them. Now, Satan is the one that tempts us. Many times people say, oh, the Lord tempted me. Mm -mm, the Lord did not tempt you. The Lord, our God, will not tempt you. He will not tempt you at all. James, in, in the first chapter of James, it says this. It says, let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. God will not tempt you. God will give you a challenge. He'll give you a trial, but he will not tempt you. He says, James said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But it says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now these temptations that we face, they're not sins. All of us today have, have been tempted. The, the, uh, the sin takes place when we act on the temptation, when we take it to the, to the next step. It says this, it says in verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, when that temptation or that lust hath conceived, uh, when it comes full, uh, that's when it says it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, the Bible tells us, it's clear, it says that the wages of sin are death. But he goes on, he gives us a hope, he says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That life that he gives us. And then James uh, encourages his, 
brethren, he says, do not err, meaning to hold fast, to, to hang on. Many of these topics that I preached about this morning are not popular topics. Nobody wants to hear about worldly distractions. We want to go out and we want to do what we want to do. We want to go out and, and, and have the pleasure and do the things that we want to do. Nobody wants to hear about slowing down and, and giving more time to God. But James tells the brethren here, he says, do not err. Do not err. Pay attention. Stay fast. He says, my beloved brethren. He says this. He said in verse number 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And I can tell you, the greatest gift and the most perfect gift from above is the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ gives to each and every one of us. He says it's, it's from above, and it cometh down from the Father of what lights. The Father of lights. The one that gives us that light. The one that that light that we've, that we've read about all morning here in Matthew chapter 5. He is the Father of lights. And he says this, he said, in him there is no variableness. In the world, there's all kinds of variableness. Many times I'm talking to somebody just this past week, this thing with COVID's rearing its head up again with this variant and this, this, that, and the other, and vaccinations, and whether they're effective and whether we should be wearing masks again or not. And I said, you know, you don't know what to believe. You don't know who to, what to read and, and what to believe or what to do. But I can go back to these verses in James and say, I'm thankful that I have a God who has no variableness. There's no variableness in our God. And he goes on, he says, neither is there shadow of turning. There's no shadow of turning with our God. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's the same when he gave this message to these disciples to be the light of the world. It's the same message that you and I need to hear today. Right. Now, we'll have suffering. We'll have trials. But he tells us here, at rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Great is our reward in heaven. So my challenge will be today is, is your light burning the way it should? Is it as bright as God would have it to be? You may be here today and you, you may say, well, I'm not sure that I even uh, can be a light for the Lord. Well, maybe you need to evaluate your heart and see if you've ever truly accepted Christ as your Savior. But I pray that, that our lights are, are bright. I pray that this message has encouraged you to go out into this world that wants to, to speak and hear of nothing but darkness. And be that light that Jesus has called us to be. That we as a church could be that city that set on a hill that the Bible says cannot be hid. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Susie, would you come to the piano?